So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Eric Chudler, who has a BS and MS and PhD in psychology from UW, where he's the executive director for the Center of Sensor Sensory Motor Neural Engineering. At the UW, he's a research associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering and Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. He is investigating the neuroactive properties of medicinal herbs and plants to help treat neurological disease. And Dr. Lise Johnson, I, I hope I pronounced both your names correctly. I didn't, oh, great. <laughs> um, who, who is a research scientist in the Department of Neurological Surgery. She has a BS in physics and a PhD in biomedical engineering. She is broadly interested in ECOG-based brain, based brain computer interfaces, specifically in how the brain changes in response to training. They both share a passion for helping improve science literacy and education, as well as developing the next generation of scientists. They're here to talk about their book, Brain Bites, Quick Answers to Quirky Questions About the Brain. Please join me and give them, give them a warm welcome. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Uh, well, uh, thank you, David, and thank you to uh, Google for inviting us uh, here today. Uh, uh, all that stuff that David mentioned uh, introducing us means that we're really interested in how the brain works. Uh, both Lisa and I are, are neuroscientists at the University of Washington. Uh, we work at the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, where we're developing a bi-directional brain-computer interface to help people with neurological problems, especially those with stroke and spinal cord injury. And today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, how your brain works. So maybe we'll take you back to your high school or your uh, university level uh, neuroscience courses or your biology courses. We'll find out what you know about the brain. It'll just be a, a quick introduction uh, to the brain. And then uh, Dr. Johnson and I have picked out two of our favorite uh, things to talk about the brain. I'll talk about does the full moon make people go crazy? And we'll get some of your opinions as well. Uh, at least we'll talk about uh, brain-computer interfaces. Uh, and then we'll just open up for questions. Um, so uh, the plan is uh, to introduce your brain. And when you think about the brain, uh, the brain does just about everything uh, that's important to you. So uh, right now I'm moving, I'm speaking, my heart is pumping, my lungs are going in and out. Uh, there, I lost my mind for a little while, sorry. Uh, uh, but your brain does just about everything that's important to you. Uh, it controls your emotions. It controls all your movement, it controls your five senses, even those senses that we don't even think about, our brain is helping us do. So if you go ahead and put your arm out in front of you. And if it wasn't your brain telling you to put your arm out there, and if you couldn't see your arm, you still get information about where your arm is. Because after a while, your arm's gonna start hurting, right? And so that part of your body is your muscles. So your muscles have sensory organs in it that sends information to your spinal cord then up to your brain. Also in all of your joints, your joints have sensory receptors in them to tell where your arms are in space and your legs are in space. Uh, hopefully the words coming out of my mouth, those sound pressure is changing and it gets into your ear. Your ear then, your eardrum vibrates. If those three bones in your ear vibrate, they send messages to the auditory nerve that are getting to your brain so you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. Uh, so the brain is really, I think, the most important part of your body. And you really can't do without a brain, uh, like you can do without other parts of your body. And I think it's the most interesting part of the body. So can you live, for example, without a, a kidney? Yeah, you can live without a kidney. Can you live without uh, a couple feet of intestine? Yeah, you, you've got you know, 20 or so feet of intestine. You could do that. Uh, can you live without your heart? Sure you can. You can live without your heart. Right? You can't live without a heart, right? And what about brain? Can you live without your brain? Can you maybe? Maybe maybe not. Maybe not 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 maybe maybe not not yet not yet. Uh, and uh, an interesting uh, a question comes up that that is if you could take a brain and you could take this brain and you could put it someplace else, would you be where your body is or would you be where your brain is? Neither. So some people would say neither. Some people would say I would be where my brain is. Some people would say, well, no, my body is who I am, and that's uh, when I see myself, that's who I am. And some people would say maybe you're not, uh, maybe you're somewhere in between. Uh, one project that I've been doing for the last six years is I've been going to India 
where I've been teaching Tibetan Buddhist monks and nuns Western neuroscience. And the first question that they asked me is, uh, Dr. Chudler, when, uh, when you die, where does the mind go? And I said, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Um, but as a scientist, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, as a scientist, I need to devise an experiment that will test that hypothesis. And I don't know an experiment that can be done to test that hypothesis. So what happens when you take a brain and you put it someplace else? Where is the mind? I, I don't know if, uh, I don't have an answer for you at this time. Um, but if you look at the brain, we know that when you change the brain, you also change various aspects of the mind. And one very important part is this outside rind of the brain. Uh, does anybody know the name of this outside part? I mean, we channel your high school, your, your university uh, nurse. What's that? Cerebellum. Uh, not time for the cerebellum yet. It's this folded outside part. Front, uh, frontal cortex would be the front part of the brain. So in general, this general area without the frontal would be the? Cortex. That would be the cortex, the cerebral cortex. And cortex comes from the Latin word meaning bark, not of a tree, but of the bark, the outside rind of the cortex. And you can actually see how that cap of that cortex kind of does cover that entire part of the brain. Uh, so inside the brain, we also have a strip here. It's not labeled here, but this is that uh, uh, 200 million axons which connect the right and left hemisphere. It's got two words to it. Both start with the letter C. Anybody? That's the corpus callosum, right, uh, connecting the left and the right hemisphere. And this area here, it's uh, sort of central. It sends information up to the cortex. It also gets information from the spinal cord as well, kind of uh, relays sensory information to various parts of the cortex. The cortex also receives part of it. Does anybody know the name of that? It starts with the letter T. T-H. That's the thalamus. That's right. That's the thalamus here. And so if that's the thalamus there, below the thalamus would be what? That would be the hypothalamus, thank you. And this part here, the middle part of the brain, that gives a big hint, it's the middle part of the brain, so it's what? It's the middle, what's that? It's obviously the midbrain. <laughs> That's what it's called, That's the midbrain there. And then this cauliflower-like thing on the back, if I was juggling on one foot and hopping up and down, this part of the brain would be very active. Also helps with my balance and posture. Now is the time for, now is the time for cerebellum. So that's about 10% of your brain uh, in the cerebellum here. And then from about this area to the top of the spinal cord would be like the bottom part of a flower, which would make it the, that would make it the brainstem. And inside uh, the brainstem is one area called the medulla. And uh, for the, some of you that are old like me may have seen the movie with uh, Adam Sandler. How many of you have seen Waterboy? Come on, you can admit it. Now, I have to watch all these movies for scientific reasons, but there's one, there's one scene in, in, in Waterboy where the, the uh, professor's talking about how uh, alligators have a large medulla oblongata. And if you remember this scene, uh, he says it's, they have a large medulla oblongata, and that's why alligators are always angry, implying that the medulla has a, some important function for emotional behavior, which I don't know. If, uh, I don't know any evidence that that's true. So I would suggest not to get your science from, especially maybe Adam Sandler uh, or Hollywood. Uh, now what about the brain? This is an average size uh, model of the brain. Uh, about how much does an average adult human brain weigh? So I think three pounds, any other guesses? Two and a half. Two and a half kilos, so that's about six pounds or so. Any other guesses? One of those answers is correct. So, so, so on average, an average adult human brain weighs about three pounds, uh, almost three pounds. And I always bring this up, and, and, and I guess no one ever saw it. About two years ago on TV, there was a, a TV show. It was like a drama. I don't know if it was a drama or a comedy. It was called Three Pounds. It was on for like three episodes, I think on CBS. Anybody see that movie called Three Pounds? No, nobody watched it. That's why it's not on anymore. <laughs> um, uh, it was all about a neurosurgeon. And it called it three pounds, I assume, because the adult human brain weighs about three pounds. Uh, what about gender uh, or sex? Are there any differences between male and female brain weights? You take a brain, you plop it on a scale, you weigh it. On average, are average male brains heavier than, male, than female brains? Or are female brains heavier than male brains? Or do they weigh about the same? So raise your hand if you think on average, an average adult male brain weighs more than an average adult or female brain. So a few people. How about on average female brains weigh more than male brains? And how about on average they weigh about the same? 
Okay, so let's look at some, um, some real data. So on this graph here, on the x-axis is how old someone is. On the y-axis is brain weight. Uh, three pounds is about 1.4 kilograms. So you can see there uh, uh, the red bars are male brain weights and blue are female brain weights. What does this graph show? So females have smaller brains than men. I once showed this graph to a group of fourth graders. And the fourth graders, they were able to understand the x and the y. And they can see that some bars were bigger than the other. And they can see that the, the red bars were, were larger. And I called on this little boy. And I said, what does this graph show? And the boy you know, is very confident. He raises his hand. And he says, this graph shows that men are smarter than women. <laughs> and I said something scientific like, uh, you know, that's a very interesting interpretation of this data. I don't know exactly, I don't know exactly what I said, but I, you know, I didn't want to make fun of him and I, I didn't want to say, oh, you know, you're wrong. But I, I, I did say that this graph doesn't say anything about how smart someone is. The same graph I showed to a group of science teachers. And one of the teachers, she was giving me the, the oh, 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 you know, raising her hand and not letting me speak. And I say, what's wrong? You, know, you have to take a cell phone call. You have to go out to, you know, what, what's wrong? And she said, you should never show this picture. And I said, why shouldn't I show this picture? This has been published a long time ago. It's been replicated many times. This is, this is a fact. Why shouldn't I show this picture? She said, you're trying to show that men are smarter than women. And I said, this graph doesn't say anything about how smart someone is. And in fact, this next graph has the exact same data, but it's plotted how large the brain is in proportion to the whole body. So this is brain-body <laughs> ratio. So how large the brain is in relation to the whole body. So if I weigh 150 pounds and my brain weighs 3 pounds, that means my brain is 2% of my total body weight. Now when you look at the data, there's almost no differences. Right? Uh, and uh, even this graph doesn't say anything about how smart someone is. Because look, a newborn baby, a newborn baby's brain is 13% of their total body weight. And so uh, you, uh, who, anybody here who has uh, little infants at home or have seen babies, know that those babies have giant balloon heads, right, on those <laughs> tiny little bodies, right? Their brains are 13% of how much they weigh. And so just because uh, someone has a large brain, has a larger brain from a portion of their body, says nothing about their intelligence. Uh, we are not the animals on Earth with the largest brains. Uh, elephants, dolphins, and whales have larger absolute brain sizes than we do. We're not the animals on Earth with the largest brains in proportion to our bodies. There's several animals. Uh, one is a hummingbird. Hummingbirds have larger brains for their body. And there's another uh, little African knife fish. It's only about this big. And uh, again, tiny, tiny little brains. But in proportion to their body, they're larger than they are in us humans. So it goes to the question, what does it mean to be intelligent? And we can talk a little bit about that after as well. So the brain uh, is made up is about 3 pounds, 1.4 kilograms. It's made up of special cells called neurons or nerve cells. And there's a whole lot of those, 86 to 100 billion. We're just rounding up to a, 100 billion. What's, what's 14 billion between friends, right? Uh, and they have those special parts. They have dendrites that receive information from other cells, uh, from other nerve cells. They send that information to a cell body. A cell body is connected to a long axon, which is a nerve fiber, which then can branch to uh, terminals at the end. And those terminals are very interesting because Two nerve cells to communicate, they don't actually touch. There's a gap, a physical gap between new, two nerve cells. So when the terminal of one cell uh, wants to talk to a dendrite of another nerve cell, there's a space. And so for one nerve cell to talk to the other nerve cell, the first nerve cell must release a little chemical neurotransmitter. And you've probably heard some of these dopamine, acetylcholine, GABA, glutamate, uh, serotonin. Those are all types of chemicals that are stored in the terminal of a nerve cell. So each neuron is like a little battery in that it generates a little bit of electricity. When that electricity gets to the end of the nerve cell, it causes those chemicals to come out. Those chemicals cross that small little space. They're picked up by receptors on the dendrite of the next nerve cell, which can then increase or decrease the likelihood of an electrical signal in that next nerve cell. And that's how signals are sent in your brain. Electrical signals within a nerve cell and chemical signals between nerve cells. So if you don't remember anything uh, else that we have to say today, if you just remember that, uh, I'd, I'd be very, very happy. Okay? Electrical inside of a nerve cell and chemical between nerve cells. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what our brain does for us. Uh, some of the basic things are taking in sensory information from the outside world, 
processing that information and sending a motor response to act on that sensory stimulus. And these are just a couple of animals that do things with their senses better than we can do. For example, uh, in the upper left there is a cat. What can a cat do with its senses better than we can do? So they have a good sense of balance. Yeah, so uh, don't do this, but if you have a cat at home and you drop it, uh, it will probably land on its feet because it has a good sense of balance. Yeah, they can also see in low light. They have a good sense of smell, very good sense of hearing as well. Uh, how about that, that butterfly? What can a butterfly do with its senses better than we can do? They can see infrared is one. Yeah, that's right. There's one more. Uh, that's, actually, they cannot infrared. Ultraviolet, as they see. They see ultraviolet. They can do one other thing and much more sensitive than, than we can do. Smell, yeah. They, have, uh, they can detect uh, very low concentrations of certain chemicals, pheromones in the air that we don't know that's there. Uh, what about a shark? Sharks have a particular sense that humans don't have at all. Uh, yeah, we can smell, but uh, I heard someone say they, have, they can detect electricity in the water. Uh, not because they use refrigerators or electric razors, but because they have the ability to detect uh, electricity generated by uh, muscles. So that's one way that they can find prey is by detecting uh, electricity uh, put off by muscles. Uh, infrared is those snakes. Uh, dolphins navigate with um, echolocation, sonar. Uh, the eels also have electro uh, receptors. A chameleon I, I put up there because uh, some chameleons, you know, they, they have their eyes on stalks and they can put one eye up and one eye down at the same time. I have no idea how they put together that visual picture whether they see split screen or whether it's unfocused, or I, I, I don't know what they see. Uh, owls also have a good sense of sight and also a good sense of vision. But uh, our senses are also very easy to trick. And so what I want you to do on this one, uh, how many of you have heard of the Stroop effect before? Just a couple of you, so good. And so what I want you to do is uh, I'm gonna point at these colors and I just want you to say out loud what color you see. And these colors are just normal colors. For example, the blue, it's just blue. It's not royal blue or dark blue or navy blue, it's just blue. Same with the green. It's not jello green, it's not lime green, it's just green. And really try, don't, don't mess up the person sitting next to you. Really try to say what color you see. Uh, some people see this as purple, some people see it as pink, I don't care. It's whatever you see, okay? So follow the bouncing ball and again, say out loud what color you see, okay? Ready, one, two, three, go, blue. blue. Good, so you, uh, just, te just, a, just a test, good. One more, uh, so what I want you to do on this one, what I want you to do on this one is do not read the word. Tell me what color the word is printed in. So this one, uh, that word, is that's, that's printed in black, uh, that color, that's printed, that's green, right? Do not read the word, tell me what color the word is printed in, okay? Ready, one, two, three, go, red. Red, green, blue, black, pink, orange, red. Good. Uh, just, just checking. So one more time. First two are blue, red, right? Okay. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three, go. Blue. blue red, green, orange, yellow, pink, blue, red, 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 Two, three, go. Blue, red, green, orange, yellow, pink, blue, red, red, orange, pink, green, red, green, yellow, blue, red, green, black, green, white. So why can you do this one and you couldn't do the other one? Because aren't you getting the same information on this one as you did from this one? Because look, that's red, R-E-D. This is green, G-R-E-E-N. Why can you do this one and you couldn't do the other one? Aren't you getting the same information? Why can you do this one and you can't do the other one? Because it's true. Of course, because it's true. Right, it just shows that, that uh, we're not so good at multitasking. And just the simple ability uh, of being able to read interferes with our ability to name the color. If, can anybody read Japanese? So if these were Japanese kanji characters for color, would you be able to, except for him, uh, would you be able to 
uh, read the color that you see? Yes. yes, because it has no meaning to you. But because it has meaning to him, he would probably have the same difficulty. Right? Uh, what I want you to do on this one is I want you to stare uh, on either this one or the other one right there where the turquoise, black, and yellow meet. I want you to look right there and keep on staring there for about 10 seconds. I'll count back. So keep on staring there. Keep on staring. I'm going to count backwards. If you blink, go back to that same spot. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Keep on staring. Blink once or twice. And you should see something there now. It's different than what you were staring at. So raise your hand if you saw the flag of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> now, how many of you saw the red, white, and blue flag? So uh, is there a red, white, and blue flag up there? Somebody said yes. No, uh, there's no red, white, and blue flag up there because I made this slide and I never made a, I, and I never put a red, white, and blue flag up there. But you still saw a red, white, and blue flag. But will you agree that it's not there? But you saw one, so where is it if it's not there? I would say it's up in here. And what is happening there is when you stare at that turquoise, yellow, and black flag, you're adapting the visual system to those turquoise, yellow, and black colors. So when you look at white, you're seeing white minus that input from uh, turquoise, yellow, and black, and your brain interprets that as red, white, and blue. Uh, how about this one? Uh, you now you know that they're kind of illusions that are fooling your senses, but does that square look like a perfect square, or does it look like the tops and sides are kind of bashed in? Yeah, you kind of see that it's squeezed in, but even though that you know it's an illusion, it's very hard to not see that illusion. How many of you on this one see a upside down white triangle? Yeah, so if there's an upside down white triangle there now, where is it now? Because I never did anything to a white triangle. All I did just now was remove black lines, and now I just added black lines. So I never added a, a white triangle. Yet again, you see a white triangle. Is there a white triangle up there? So some of you are going like, some of you are, I don't think know what's going on now. <laughs> yeah. And no white square. Uh, oh, I see a white square. <laughs> On this one, I know there's a white square because I put it there. <laughs> uh, so I would claim that, that your brain is just trying to help. That's what the brain is doing. It's just there to help. Now, how about this one? If A was going to go completely across that uh, rectangle, would it be a perfect match with B? Would it be a perfect match with C? Or maybe I'm trying to trick you and it lines up somewhere in the middle or on either side. So raise your hand if you think that A would be a perfect match with B. Raise your hand. So there's a few people over here. How about it's a perfect match with C? And how about I'm trying to trick you and it match up with anywhere? See, to me, to me, to me this, is, this is fascinating. Because here we have about you know, 30 or 40 people. You're all looking at the same thing. And you're coming up with different answers. And it didn't seem to be that everybody over here said A, everybody over here said B, and people over here said C. It was kind of distributed around. Why, if you're looking at the exact same image, are you coming up with different answers? Because it's ambiguous. And so maybe I'm also, maybe I'm also leading you. So, so for example, uh, if to, to lead you again, uh, go ahead and put your hands, hands like this. And uh, now what I want you to do is point your thumbs at each other. And now keep on rotating around, point them down. And then take your right hand and put it under your left hand and interlock your fingers. And as your fingers are, uh, point them out like that. So you don't, yeah, but don't hit anybody in front of you. Yeah, OK. So with your hands like this, point it out in front of you. Now all I want you to do is rotate like this. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> of course I did. Uh, but again, it's just because, of, uh, because uh, a little distraction altered the way that you think and altered the way that you perceive. And perhaps that's the same with this one, is because you have certain expectations and your brain is just trying to help you make sense of the world. So it's, a, it's actually a B. So maybe I was trying to trick you by trying to trick you, by trying to trick you. Right. Uh, and as I said, the brain is just trying to help. So even though your brain doesn't get all the information it needs, you can still read these sentences. For example, the top line says what? And the bottom line says, yeah, and your brain is just there trying to help you. 
So even though your brain doesn't get all the information it needs, it is just there to help. So I want to turn this over to Dr. Johnson, and she's going to tell you about one of her favorite things, brain-computer interfaces. One of my favorite things, I don't know. Raindrops and roses are my favorite things. <laughs> um, so Eric asked me to put together some slides that would be broadly interesting and kind of about the book, and I thought we should talk about brain-computer interfaces because it's very topical if anybody's been reading the news this morning. There's some stuff about brain-computer interfaces, and also because I thought this might be sort of a tech-friendly crowd. I thought you guys might be into some of that. So when we talk about brain-computer interfaces or BCIs, there's usually two categories that we think about. So the first would be motor-based brain-computer interfaces and then sensory, which would be kind of the opposite. So when you talk about a motor-based BCI, the first thing we need to do is measure the electrical potential of the brain. And if you guys were listening while Eric was talking, he said that our brains use electricity to communicate, which is true. And it's also extremely convenient as engineers because we know a little bit about electricity, right? So we know how to record electricity, we know how to produce electricity, and that gives us some options for interfacing with the nervous system. So once we've measured that electrical potential, then we need to decode the signal. So often when I give this talk to kids, I say, it doesn't come out in English and it doesn't come out in Spanish, and it's like a revelation to everyone in the room. What does it come out as? Um, and I had a woman come up to me one time after I gave this talk at a bookstore and she said, how do you do that? Really, how do you do that? Um, and it turns out that you need to do a lot of signal processing in order to do that. So when we talk about decoding, what we're really talking about is looking at the time frequency analysis of the signal and trying to figure out how that corresponds to behaviors that we might observe. Um, then we use that decoded signal to control an external device. So it's a bit of a misnomer to say it's a brain-computer interface, because sometimes a computer doesn't really get into the mix much at all. Um, then when we have the sensory device, we're usually going exactly the opposite direction. Then we want to measure a physical signal in the world. So a physical signal might be light, right? We could measure photons. We could measure sound. We could measure pressure. We could measure all kinds of interesting things about the world. We could measure IR if we wanted to. Um, then we encode the signal into an electrical pattern, um, which is sort of trying to figure out the opposite of this problem, and then electrically stimulate the brain. So one of the fun things about the brain is that if you pump a little bit of current in, you usually get some sort of response on the other end. If you do it in the right way, then you can get meaningful sensory responses. Um, and because uh, brain-computer interfaces are generally thought of as therapeutic in some way, then that's what we want on the other end, is a meaningful sensory response. Um, and while it might sound futuristic, there are some of these already running around out there in the real world. Um, so let's go over some of the ones that currently exist. Does anybody know what this is right up here? Cochlear implant, cochlear implant. yes, very good. Um, so a cochlear implant is a stimulating device for people that have profound hearing loss or deafness. Um, what you're looking at here is just the external portion of it, um, which has the um, microphone and also some of the signal processing parts. And then on the inside, there's actually an array of electrodes implanted in the cochlea, which is that snail-shaped part of the inner ear. Um, and they stimulate through the electrodes into that space in the ear. It stimulates the auditory nerve um, and causes the perception of sound. Uh, these have been around for quite a while now, since the 80s. And it turns out that they're so good now that people can actually hear speech and identify speech even in the absence of visual cues. So for example, on a telephone, a person with a cochlear implant would be able to understand speech. And you probably notice um, that this person is small and bald, meaning what? It's a baby, right? <laughs> so, so why would you put a cochlear implant in a baby? So they will have the chance to learn how to hear and learn how to speak. Right. So we have kind of all of the facets of this answer going around. So the idea is that your brain goes through critical periods where you learn how to interpret different kinds of sensory information. And critical periods usually happen very early in life. I think I could say they exclusively happen early in life when your brain is developing. Um, and if you don't receive sensory inputs during that period, you will never really learn how to interpret it. So if you don't get auditory information when you're very young, you just don't learn how to hear. You don't learn how to interpret speech. Um, and so they found that the earlier you can put it in, the device in to a deaf individual, the more um, they're going to be able to understand hearing and auditory signals later in life. It's extremely controversial. Why? It's 
Because hmm? consent. consent is an issue, right? An infant isn't capable of consenting. Um, this is, you know, it's actually a very minimally invasive surgery as surgeries go, but it is a surgery. Um, and a lot of people consider it an elective surgery. A lot of members of the deaf community consider deafness not really to be a disability and not really to be a problem that needs solving. Um, and I don't really have any great insights or solutions on this. I'm just pointing out this is, in fact, a problem that comes up um, in brain-computer interface land. Um, this next one down here, we have uh, a less young individual um, with this particular implant. Does anybody know what this is? Kind of. It's close. To, so it is a visual implant. A retinal implant, yeah. So this is the Argus II, um, which is developed by Second Sight. It has recently, I think 2013, received FDA approval. So there are people um, at various places in the country, various centers in the country, that are actually implanting these retinal implants for people that have um, total vision loss, so they're completely blind. Um, and the retinal implant is, like you might guess, implanted on the retina. Uh, retinal anatomy has sort of a strange naming convention, so front and back might not mean exactly what they seem like they should mean. But in any case, it's implanted um, on the surface of your retina that sort of touches all that gooey eyeball jelly stuff in the middle. That's where the implant is. Um, there's a camera right in the middle of these glasses, and the camera is recording the visual scene. It's doing a lot of processing on that information to get it um, to uh, sort of uh, I can't remember how many contacts they have, but it's, it's on the order of like 100 electrodes or on the surface of the retina, and then it stimulates um, the retina, the, the remaining cells on the retina, with that visual information. Um, there's a couple of conditions where this is really good. Uh, so if you have uh, what's called age-related macular degeneration, then your photoreceptor cells degenerate over time on the retina. Um, that's one condition where this is an appropriate device. The other one would be retinitis, retinitis pigmentosa, um, which is actually a heritable condition um, where people also progressively lose their photoreceptors. But in both of those conditions, um, the rest of the cells in the retina tend to be preserved, so it's useful to have a retinal implant. It's not useful to have a retinal implant if you're blind because you don't have eyes, right? If you lose an eye, a retinal implant isn't going to do you really all that much good. There are kinds of other visual implants that people are developing. Um, you can have a cortical implant. There are some groups that are working on uh, thalamic implants. This is kind of a different idea. Um, does anybody know what this is? Somebody said something, but I didn't hear what it was. <laughs> yep, exactly. That's totally what it is. Um, so <laughs> this is what we call a tactile visual sensory substitution device, right? So the idea is you take visual information, he's wearing the really cool glasses again with the camera on the front, taking that visual information and turning it into a tactile input. So tactile input is what? I'm holding up my hand so everybody can sort of... Touch. Touch, your sense of touch. Um, and in this case, they're not putting it on the guy's fingertips because you use your fingers for a lot of stuff, especially if you're blind. They're putting it um, in this cool headband right on his forehead. I've also seen them on the tongue. Um, you can also put them on the back or the neck. Um, you have a different distribution of sensory receptors across the surface of your body. So there are some places where you're going to get better acuity from this than others. Um, but this is also a kind of brain-computer interface a much less invasive kind of brain-computer interface. Um, so moving on to motor kinds of brain-computer interfaces, this guy up here um, has a very severe spinal cord injury. Um, you can see he's actually on a respirator, so he has a complete transection of his spinal cord, um, very high. Um, and uh, so when I give this talk to students, I usually say, well, he was in a knife fight, and the first thing we should learn from this is that nobody should get in a knife fight, right? <laughs> Um, and that's still good advice, even if you're not a kid. <laughs> um, so this thing that looks like a plug that's going into his brain is, in fact, a plug that's going right into his brain. Okay? So the scientists at Brown University, as part of this uh, research venture called BrainGate, have implanted electrodes into the part of his brain that used to control movement of his arm and his hand. Um, and then when they record uh, the activity of those cells when he's thinking about or trying to move his arm or his hand, they turn that into a signal which controls uh, a computer cursor 
on a screen. And this was uh, really one of the first demonstrations of a human brain-computer interface. And this group has continued to develop the technology, um, and they now have people moving really fancy robotic arms um, exclusively with brain power. And it's all very sci-fi and very cool. Um, so this is uh, another kind of motor-based brain-computer interface. So uh, this person obviously has had an amputation as a result of a motorcycle accident. So the lesson there is everyone be very careful when you're riding a motorcycle, right? Um, and she's very lucky because she went to the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and they tried out this new technique where they took the severed nerve stump that was left over after the amputation and they pulled out the motor part of the nerve, right? So you have um, the, the nerves that are going down or yeah, the neurons that are, the axons of the neurons that are going down to innervate the muscles. And then you also have the sensory receptors that are coming back to give information to your brain. So they took out the motor part of that and they actually implanted it in the pectoral muscle right here. Um, and then after those nerve roots sort of grew back and innervated the pectoral muscle, when she thought about moving her arm or her hand, it actually caused contraction of that muscle. Um, and then they can put electrodes on the surface of that muscle, de detect the electrical activity of the muscle, and then use that to control this really tremendously complicated robotic arm. So now when she thinks about moving her hand, the robotic hand actually moves, which is super cool. And then also got sort of a bonus with this, and that the sensory nerves also grew back and innervated that pectoral muscle. So now, um, when you press on different parts of that muscle and the skin overlaying that muscle, it actually feels like somebody's pressing on her fingertips of her hand, right? So then they can instrument the arm, they can put pressure detectors on the fingertips, and she can actually get sensory feedback. So we actually have a closed loop brain-computer interface in this case. Um, down here is another kind of motor-based brain-computer interface. Um, so this is uh, for people that have high but not very high level spinal cord injury. So it's for people that have a C6 or C7 level injury. It comes out of the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, um, and it's actually called the free hand. And the idea behind this is that they implant electrodes right into the muscle bodies. They have seven electrodes that get implanted into the muscle bodies in the arm. People that have that level of injury, that C6, C7, they have movement of their shoulder and they can usually extend their elbow, but they can't grasp or ungrasp their hand, right? So what they can do is stimulate those muscles. When you stimulate the muscles, they contract. Um, and if you do it in the right order, you, what you get on the other end are functional movements. So it's called functional electrical stimulation. Um, so what they're able to do, even with seven electrodes, um, it's not nearly as many electrodes as you have muscles in your arm. You have about 30 muscles controlling your arm. So seven is just a small subset of that. They're able to give people a few different kinds of grasp. And even with those few different kinds of grasp, people are able now to um, really enhance their independence, right? So they can brush their teeth where before they couldn't. They can feed themselves. They can um, do all kinds. Of, I, I've, I've even seen pictures of people playing tennis um, with the free hand system where they couldn't have done that before. Um, so unfortunately, this device is no longer available. And one of the reasons for that is because it's only useful for people that have this very specific level of injury. And why would that be the case? Um, that's a good point to think about sort of spasticity issues. Um, and that's, spasticity is always an issue when you have a spinal cord in injury, um, and it's also very unpredictable, but that's actually not the case. It's not the, it's not the driving factor here. Right, so ec the economics are the reason why it's not broadly you know, commercializable. But the reason it's only really useful to people that have this C6, C7 level injury is because these people can move their shoulder. And shoulder movement is important because there's no brain part of this device. You have to be able to communicate with this device in some way, right? And so the way that they did it is they put a joystick on the wheelchair with the contralateral shoulder and they're able to move the joystick by moving their shoulder around. So recently there have been um, some people that have tried to sort of connect this with this to connect the whole brain control interface part with the muscle control. Um, 
Um, there's a group at Ohio State that did a, a proof of concept of this um, last year-ish. Um, so that's sort of the state of the art in brain-computer interfaces, and I think Eric wants to take you a different direction. Yeah, just, just the opposite direction. Lise brought you all the way to the future. I'm bringing you all the way back to the past, way in the past, where for many years uh, people have looked up to the moon and have assigned blame to the moon for, for many different reasons. So uh, we get the word lunacy, right? The root word lunacy comes from the word luna, meaning moon, right? And for many years, people have tried to assign blame to the moon for things like uh, traffic accidents, uh, domestic violence calls, uh, poisoning, suicides, murders, violence. And these data are relatively easy to extract, right? You go to the police blotter, you go to the almanac, and you can see what phase of the moon and match it up to a particular day and count how many accidents or traffic accidents or, or what. And there have been close to 100 different studies looking at a lot of these different behaviors, and there's no evidence to suggest that the phase of the moon affects behavior in any way. Now, that won't dissuade many people. And in fact, uh, at my house, we had uh, someone over at the house, I won't mention her name, uh, but she uh, is in law enforcement. And, uh, you know, at my house, somehow, I don't know how, we end up talking about the brain. Don't ask me how that happens. But, uh, uh, and we, the, the full moon came up, and uh, she said, oh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, when I'm out on patrol, uh, I pull more people out of the ditch, and I go to more domestic violence cases when that full moon is out. And I said, well, don't those things happen at other times of the month? And she said, well, yeah, it happens, but I just don't notice it. And I said, exactly. Uh, because if you look at the literature, you'll find that there's a, almost no correlation between the phase of the moon and any of these unusual abnormal behaviors. Uh, and really, uh, the physics of it don't make sense either, that the gravitational pull of the, uh, on the Earth just don't match the, uh, in, in the human body. So there's really no reason for it. But the people that have the strongest beliefs that the moon does affect behavior are people in law enforcement and medical personnel. And my hypothesis is that in these professions that are high stress jobs, that they see bad things happen. They see horrific accidents. And if they can assign blame to something like the moon, then it will relieve stress from them. Now, I, that's my hypothesis. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But again, if you look at the uh, types of professions, and there have been studies about who holds the strongest beliefs, it are those in, in very high stress uh, positions. Yeah. Was there any reverse found in the data where the lack of light, which you would find more of on a full moon light, reduced? Yeah, so that's, that's one hypothesis, is why, why, do, why did it originally come up? And some people say, well, maybe in the old days, before there was artificial light, uh, the artificial light provided uh, thieves and robbers and uh, more uh, light to do their nefarious actions, and then the police could also see them. Uh, and so that would cause, uh, so that's one hypothesis about why, but why, it, that might be why it, the myth started, but why it ex still exists when we have artificial light, it doesn't really make sense. Um, so why, that, why that's the case, uh, uh, we don't really know for sure. Um, but uh, that's the end of our formal presentation. I just want to, again, thank uh, David and, and Google for having us, uh, our publisher, Norton and & Company, and also the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, where both uh, Lisa and I work. So uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, you know, now is kind of your time uh, that you know, there's something about the brain and you didn't know if it was true or not. Uh, we might have an answer for you. Uh, or something we that... We might make one up. Yeah, we won't, we won't make one up. <laughs> uh, but um, if there's a, a question that you have, now's the time to ask. Um, so there's a lot of information online about the pineal gland and specifically how uh, fluoride supposedly affects it in some magical, mysterious way. Are there, is there any merit to these claims? What is the pineal gland and yeah. how does it work? Yeah, so the pineal gland is a, is a, is a gland. Pineal comes from the word pine nut or pine, and this is a little pine cone shaped thing right in the center of the brain. Uh, the long history of it uh, is uh, Descartes uh, uh, originally thought that that was the seat of the soul, maybe because it was in the center of the brain. It releases a lot of serotonin. It might have some uh, 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 function in circadian rhythms and things like that. But I haven't heard anything about uh, fluoride or its effect. I, I, I haven't seen any data on that. Um, so the function of it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, not, it's like a gland, 
um, might have to do with some circadian rhythms and things like that, but I haven't heard anything specifically about fluoride. As a neuroscientist, I mean, the, the field of neuroscience is so huge that, uh, you know, I, I kind of know my area, but what's, what's happening in other areas, it's, it's very difficult with thousands and thousands of papers being generated every year. And in fact, you know, for the book, I have, uh, I, you know, I wrote some of the answers to the questions, but Lee brings a whole area of expertise that I don't have. Uh, and that's kind of like, you know, a question like that is, it's very hard to follow the most recent literature. Um, but I haven't heard anything about that. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like we are now able to decode, uh, like to go information from the brain for things like uh, related to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, like our, our modal functions and, and sensory. Uh, are we close to actually being able to do the same of decoding brain electrical information? Uh, with regards to higher level uh, brain functions like you know memory and uh, and perhaps conscious thinking and, and so forth, are we even close to that? Are you optimistic about it? Um, so I think it's a it's kind of an interesting question because <clears throat> so there's a lot of different kinds of higher level thinking, right? So memory is a little bit different um, than like higher order cognitive function um, because there's a very specific part of the brain that we know is very involved in memory formation and people have been recording activity from the hippocampus and from the perihippocampal areas for a really long period of time and can record um, a lot of how those memory traces are laid down and stored. Um, and in some cases they say that they can tell um, exactly what memories are being recalled at any given time. So I think in that case, we're a lot closer than we would be in some of the other higher order thinking. When you're talking about higher cognitive processes, you're usually talking about frontal areas. Um, and when I was in graduate school, we called it the prefrontal vortex, right? Like there's, there's so much stuff going on in there. There's so much association that I think it's really hard to piece apart any individual thing. Um, and so, when you get down to the sort of more basic functions like motor or sensory, I think there's a much higher probability that we'll be able to decode those functions specifically. Um, which is, but you know, but there are certain things you can tell. Like, so for example, there's a, what we call the error-related negativity, which you can record from EEG. When somebody has made a mistake and they know that they've made a mistake in a task, you can record that. Um, when somebody sees something that's surprising and also meaningful to them, there's an EEG signature to that that people can record as well. So there are certain things that you can pick out, but in terms of just decoding somebody's thoughts or stream of consciousness, I think we're a really long, long way from that. So I have a question about one of the uh, these brain computer interfaces where there was a guy with electrodes stuck into his brain and he was able to move. Uh, mouse, like cursor mouse. So, uh, how does it work? Does it like uh, attach like four electrodes into some like random area of the brain, or find like particular specific area? And uh, do they? Does he have to train actually to think about certain things? Or right. So, um, in this case, they're usually implanting the Utah array, which was developed in Utah, um, and it has about 100 electrodes on it. Um, and they're all sort of shaft-style electrodes, and you implant them all within one very small area of the brain. Um, and in this case, they really want to target the part of the brain that used to control movement of the hand or the arm, because the idea is that that will be the most natural um, way to control the device. So usually they would put the person in an fMRI scanner, and then they would have the person think about moving their hand or arm, and that gives them a way to localize the part of the brain that would be involved with that. And then in, in, when they go into surgery, they try and implant that right there. Um, but there is a fair bit of training involved. Um, and it, it, it actually gets very complicated. You may have to train the device every day because the neurons surrounding the implant might also die or become inaccessible for other reasons. Um, so it's not as if you put the implant in and then you can magically just move your arm the way that you used to, or you can move a computer cursor without effort. You do have to train on the device. So normally we have the ability to imagine moving our arm without actually moving it, but this, in this person using the computer interface, if he just imagines moving his arm, is, is that arm going to move whether he really wants it to or not? Um, that's a good question. Um, so when we imagine moving our arms, it's actually the same part of our brain is active as when we actually move our arms, um, at least 
so I should say the part of the brain that they're recording, that same part of the brain is active whether you imagine or whether you actually move your arm. So presumably, then, if somebody had a brain-computer interface that they were using every day in their life, then if they just sort of imagined using it, that would also trigger activation of the arm. Um, maybe designers would think about that and implement some sort of on-off cue. I mean, that's, that's the thing that people think about for other reasons, is how can you inactivate your device when you don't want it to be working. Um, there's also, you know, there's a lot of plasticity in your brain. The brain has a chance to change itself a lot. And I sort of would think, I would hypothesize that your brain might natively be able to overcome that particular barrier if, it, if you used it a lot. Oh, dreaming is kind of a hard one, but it, so if you were in the phase of sleep, in REM sleep, where you have these vivid dreams, uh, I kind of think so, if your device is on. Yeah, yeah but, but that's an interesting question, and it brings up additional questions that say that either you're dreaming and all of a sudden your arm moves, or if you're walking down the street and all of a sudden your arm moves, and say it injures someone, maybe someone that's in the bed with you, or you're walking down the street and then it hits somebody that you don't know, who is responsible? <clears throat> for that injury that you caused with that arm. Because you were sleeping, it wasn't me that caused it. it, the arm just moved by itself. So who's responsible? Is it the person whose arm moved? Is it the engineer who built the arm? Is it the physician who installed the arm? Or is it the, the programmer who programmed that arm and, or, the, or, or decoded that signal and then sent that signal out? Who's responsible for it? So these are questions that in this entire field that perhaps engineers and neuroscientists are perhaps not equipped to answer. And at the Center for Sensory Motor Neural Injury, where we work, we are actually collaborating with uh, philosophers and neuroethicists in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Washington to ask some of these questions because scientists and engineers, sometimes we can do these things, but how should we do these things and, and should we do these things are questions that we don't always ask before they're developed. And so we're trying to get some of these questions at least brought up and discussed, not only within our own community, but with the end users. Those people that will be the recipients of these devices, they should have some say in what they're going to do and what they can do and what they can't do and what they look like. Um, so these are, these are uh, you know, the, the, the simple, not, not, not such a simple, but the, the obvious questions lead to many, many other questions which are, are deeper on so many different levels. So you mentioned giving this talk to uh, Buddhists, and I believe there was an interesting outcome of the Dalai Lama undergoing an MRI. Are there any avenues of research along those lines around self-brain modulation, et cetera? Yeah, I, I don't know of the Dalai Lama himself uh, undergoing an MRI, but there have been, uh, uh, there is research going on with Tibetan Buddhist monks who have come to the States. Uh, and have been meditated in the scanners and they're trying to correlate some of the changes that go on in the brain during meditation. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know if there's uh, been a lot of, of, of data that can be extracted to suggest how we can become compassionate like they are from, from, the, from the literature, uh, but that's ongoing research. And so what is the neural basis of meditation? Uh, that might give rise to the neural correlate of consciousness itself. Uh, and, you know, as scientists, we've always tried to uh, externalize everything. You know, we, we measure in other people. But consciousness and compassion is something that comes from within. And so maybe it's something that, that we need to look within ourselves and study ourselves as opposed to studies others to maybe get to some of those questions. So um, that, that research is ongoing. It's a relatively very new uh, line of research combining uh, meditation and modern neuroscience. Uh, and I think the data is still waiting to come. Well, um, thank you very much for coming to present to us and answering all our questions and all. Okay. Thank you.